Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. I uh, am coming here on a Thursday, midday in the market. So uh, not only do we still have a day and a half of trading in this first week of September market action, but we were off on Monday, obviously, in the markets for the Labor Day holiday. So you're, you really have, so far we had about half a week's worth of activity. Kind of boring in the Dow. We're down a little bit on the week, not much. And uh, not so boring in the NASDAQ. It's down about 2.5% on the week. Um, a lot of volatility. You know, obviously you have a pretty expensive technology sector to begin with. And then they've had these hearings going on um, on Capitol Hill. And you've had the CEO of Facebook and Twitter. And there were others invited who didn't come. But again, a lot more of this sort of political scrutiny in some of the new tech, big tech, cool tech sectors and that's sort of a theme that we've been talking about all year um, playing itself out so some enhanced downside volatility in the nasdaq this week but in instead of giving you kind of the run by a run of what's been going on this particular week in the markets I, I, let me review a few broader things that i think are playing out towards the end of the year i think are the key kind of principles as we look into this final third of the year um no question that the earnings story will continue, and and I believe that we'll continue to see a kind of uh, differing results quarter by quarter as to which companies are sort of outperforming expectations because you get this sort of cycle going where certain companies really outperform what was expected. They raise their guidance forward, and then for them to come in and again surprise after the prior quarter had built in an enhanced expectation is very difficult to do. And other companies that maybe didn't, they end up being more susceptible to an upside surprise. So that's where you get this term stock pickers market. You get different companies that are able to surprise one way or the other. And of course, that can work to the downside as well. And that's what's an interesting thing about the second quarter is you had a couple companies that were really leading the market um, get crushed, that, that had devastating reaction in the market to their results, and a couple companies that had these overwhelmingly positive things. But, you know, let me let me give you a little background here as to what is, I think is is going on more so than is being talked about. This re, this repatriation story is a bigger story than is is getting airtime. Uh, the the corporate tax cut uh, helped almost all publicly traded companies and private for that matter as well. Um, it helped some more than others in terms of the impact to their bottom line and what it's meant for. Uh, rising after-tax earnings, you combine that with uh, good top-line revenue growth in what is a healthy economy, and the markets really liked a lot of that story. But um, the repatriation, where they pay a one-time tax to bring profits that are currently being held overseas back, well, we um, right now believe that there is over $500 billion that has already come back. And, and our projections had that through the first half of the year that they were going to be about $300 billion, which is an awful lot of, of stimulus. If you think about it, the entire net savings to all corporate America out of the corporate income tax cut is less than $100 billion for this year. The entire uh, penalty to the economy for these trade and tariff things has, has been 6 or $7 billion so far, and it's working its way up to maybe... Um, 20 billion. Okay, so you you um, you have a, a corporate tax impact that's real positive, and then a, a trade tariff impact that's negative. But both those numbers um, are being totally dwarfed by the by the um, uh, effect of, of of companies bringing cash back offshore. One company in particular, just to, I say this for illustrative purposes only, Cisco, it, it does happen to be in our portfolio, but I mention it only to give you the anecdotal uh, information. They've already repatriated $67 billion. So one company has almost brought back the equivalent of what the whole corporate tax cut has equaled. And, and one company has brought back what is multiples of the uh, contraction that the trade and tariff nonsense has created. Now, so what happens to all that cash? You know, stock buybacks, uh, growing dividends, uh, reduction of debt, M&A, and capital expenditures um, are all on the menu. 
and it's a combination of all those things and all of them are bullish for stocks. All of them are positive one way or the other. Some may be more so than others. Some maybe have more of a multiplier effect in the economy. Certainly some have a greater political benefit to the companies and to the president than others. But my point being, they're all very bullish for those who hold shares of stock in the American economy. So I believe that this repatriation story, there's about 2.6 trillion that was held offshore. I think that you're gonna to continue to see a meaningful amount move back. Well, what are the top performing sectors so far in the year? Two of the three top performing sectors are technology and healthcare. 80% um, of the repatriation of foreign profits are in the technology and healthcare sector. It's not 100%, but it's high 70s, low 80s. And I believe there's a direct correlation between that, that the reason those two sectors are doing so well in this high degree of repatriation, I think is a very connected story. So I personally think that what we're seeing right now is early innings of the impact of tax reform, um, expected bullishness coming from the increase to profitability and the greater um, capital allocation that, co that comes from repatriated cash back on shore. Uh, and, and as far as the multiples and the valuations and where we are in the market, I think that, that there continues to be a significant element of opportunity in the energy sector and consumer staples have seen their valuations come down. Telecom has been by far the most beat up. You notice in the first half of the year, it was utilities and REITs. They've really uh, seen a lot of health come back into those sectors. So um, I, I don't know why any investor right now would want to try to guess what, what sector is going to be the hot dot next week or next month. Um, all you can do is stay diversified and find where the better valuations lie and allow those longer term uh, stories to play out. Uh, that's very much what we're doing on an individual company basis and of course on, on a sector basis as well. Uh, one thing I point out in Dividend Cafe this week in the written version that I'm gonna share with you on the video here. This is, it's so funny. People perceive this as a, been a very positive year or market's doing well. Well, the, the US stock market wasn't even positive on the year until um, like two months ago, um, in, into July, it kind of went back into positive. It was up big in January, went negative in February, teetered around March, April, May, June, more negative than positive. And then it kind of went slightly into positive territory, led by a lot of these leadership names in the technology sector. And now we're up on the year in the S&P and the Dow. Okay, But every other asset class, you could pretty much say, is negative on the year. If you're in European equities, you're down. If you're in emerging market equities, you're down. If you're in Japanese equities, you're down. If you're in U.S. bonds, you're down. If you're in global bonds, you're down. Internet emerging bonds, commodities, most aspects of the real estate sector are negative. So, so what you have on the year is essentially the one asset class that people were afraid of and wanting to diversify around has been the only positive asset class and all of the other asset classes that you diversify into to create that asset allocation benefit are the ones that are actually negative. So if there's some investor who's 100% invested in US equity, um, that investor should be up on the year. Um, and, and even if you're asset allocated, like of course we do at the Bonson Group, you're still up on the year, but you have certain hands giving and certain hands taking away, and which is the whole point of a diversified and a globally diversified portfolio. But even those that have a heavy equity concentration, the fact of the matter is most people, uh, wisely, we would argue, are prudent enough to pursue global equity diversification. And in this particular year, so far, as we sit here in the early part of September, U.S. equities have done well and, and, and uh, non-U.S. equities have not. And so that creates a, a blended effect. Um, it's a challenging year for asset allocators because... You, you have inflationary concerns that end up hurting bonds and ultimately stocks, uh, uh, potentially. Um, you have uh, the fear about currency, what the dollar does. Uh, if the dollar were to continue dropping, you, you have a great opportunity in emerging markets and the dollar going higher has suffered in emerging markets, but the dollar is taking its P's and Q's from the Fed and people are unclear what the Fed will end up doing. So, so this guesswork, I, I, I know in my heart that everybody believes this, but I want to reiterate it. The solution is not to guess. 
what U.S. will do next week and what international will do the week after that and what the Fed will do and how emerging will respond to the Fed or what Japan will do and how the Fed will respond to Japan and blah, blah, blah. That diversification that comes from an asset allocation process where you have proper exposure and weighted around the risk reward composition of a given investor and their goals and their situation this is the right way to be invested at this time. And if every single thing in your portfolio is going up at once, it means everything in your portfolio can go down at once. And having a period where the most meaningful asset class is higher and some of the other asset classes are lower it happens to be the period that most investors are in now. That's not a bad thing. That's the way asset allocation works. So I hope that reminder is useful to you. What I won't do now in the video is what I devoted most of the time in DividendCafe.com this week to and what we did an entire podcast for uh, at our Advice and Insights podcast. And that is a little bit more elaborated treatment um, of the subject about passive versus active investing. And so I did about a 15-minute podcast on it. I'd encourage you to listen to it, Advice and Insights. And it has a lot of the, um, the coverage this week in uh, our Dividend Cafe writing. Um, it, it, but I, I, my thesis, I'll cheat a little, is that people are not giving the wrong answers. They're asking the wrong questions. And I, I, you might be interested in that as well. But I've gone on long enough. I'm going to let it go. Uh, I'll be back to you next week from New York. We've got some big meetings out there in the city next week. We'll be doing our normal Dividend Cafe uh, from New York. Um, and in the meantime, please reach out with any questions any concerns, any comments, but I do believe that the wisdom I just uttered around asset allocation may very well be the best wisdom you will hear about investing for the remainder of this week. Go USC. Fight on. Thanks for listening and watching The Dividend Cafe. One thing I, I want to point out real quick too, if you're interested, at marketepicurean.com, I am starting uh, now in conjunction with the 10-year anniversary of the financial crisis, I am writing a series of short articles commemorating some of those key milestones, those key days, the day Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac went down and the day Lehman went bankrupt and, the, and all those things and tying it in together for kind of a big picture uh, lesson um, around the, the history of the financial crisis and, and some of the investment things that we can carry going forward as well. But if you're interested in that, go to marketepicurean.com, excuse me, marketepicurean.com. They're short articles, but I think, and, and they're going to just come out day by day at, throughout the, this whole month. But I think you're going to find it interesting. I'd love for you to check it out. Subscribe to Market Epicurean if you wanted to hit up in your inbox, okay?